Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 today. I want to look at verses 42 and following. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you hear our prayers. We want to praise you because you are a great God and that you would speak to us through your word today is a great honor. Lord, we would hear what you have to say through Christ, I pray. Amen. Acts 42, Acts 2, 42 and following may be the most concise description of healthy Christianity that we can find anywhere. As I read it recently, as you read it right now, think about what, what common theme do you hear? What one common theme do you hear? There are many, but what one? We read, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now, all of the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in temple courts. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. Such a gold mine in that passage. What stands out for you? What stands out for me is how much time Christians spent together. How much of Christian, just being a Christian meant being together with other Christians in relationship. Notice again what they did. Now, remember the bottom line is the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church was having impact. And for, in fact, the church goes from being this uh, little peripheral group of unpopular, unknown people within a few centuries, overturning one of the greatest empires the world's ever known. How did they do that? The power of God through Christians together. Notice they devoted themselves. In other words, they had a deep commitment to the apostles' teaching. Where did they hear that? Together. To the fellowship. The word there is koinonia. Um, so it, it's the word from which we get our word coin. So in there, there's the implication of, of taking up offering and but but the the bigger idea it means literally means fellowshipping together. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, communion together, and to prayer together. Everyone was filled. Verse forty three. Everyone was filled with awe, and many signs and wonders were being performed through the apostles. Obviously, as they were together, not just the apostles individually, but together, God's doing this. Verse 44, all the believers were together and held things in common, sharing life together. By the way, this is not socialism. It's so sad that people have, are so influenced by Marxist thinking. Um, this is not something that is forced by the power of the state and redistributed by an elite group in government who chooses who the winners and losers are. This is individual people choosing because of love of God in relationships with other people to help other people. It's the opposite of Marxism, of socialism. Verse 46, they sold their possessions and properties and distributed all the proceeds as any had need. Again, taking care of each other. They became, a, because they're together, they become aware of each other's needs and they respond to their needs together. Verse 46, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. Every day they met together in temple courts and broke bread from house to get house. Together, 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 together. They ate food in their, they ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. Again, together. This is not talking about somebody individually taking their lunch pail and going by themselves. Together they're eating, enjoying um, each other, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, verse 47. Again, even outsiders are experiencing their fellowship. Outsiders are seeing the richness of their, of their friendships, of, their, of the church, and they're saying, we want to be a part of that. We need that. And therefore, every day, the Lord added to their number those who are being 
saved. That's the result. They devoted themselves to these things. Here's the next question. How do you think our devotion to being together today compares to their devotion to God and to each other? Kind of convicting, isn't it? I've often thought, boy, how, how do we get the church, how do we get Christians today to be the church of the first century, to have the power that they had, God using them? Well, part of it has to be Christians wanting to be together, sharing life together. What do you think it would look like if we were as devoted to God and to each other as they? Here's the challenge. We live in such an individualistic time for whatever variety of reasons. Call it selfishness, call it the you know, response of uh, enlightenment thinking, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the philosophers who would talk about, you know, the in, uh, utilitarian individualism where we all think that if we just pursue our own individual gains, our own individual best interests, that somehow the communal best interest will emerge. Well, the reality is COVID didn't help. I recently read, the COVID-19 the COVID epidemic wreaked havoc on our social lives. Time spent with friends went down. Time spent alone went up. According to the Census Bureau's American Time Use Survey, <laughs> uh, I like to quote this just because I paid for the survey. Anyway, uh, between 2010 and 2013, as a taxpayer, you paid for this survey too. Um, the amount of time the average American spent with friends was stable from 2010 to 2013, about 6.5 hours per week. In 2014, time spent with friends began to decline. By 2019, the average American was spending only four hours a week with friends, a sharp 37% decline from the five years before. And then COVID hit and the trend deepened. In 2021, the average American spent only two hours and 45 minutes a week with close friends. That's a 58%, almost a 60% decline from 2013. Similar declines have been seen even when the definition of friends is expanded to include acquaintances like neighbors and coworkers and clients. The average American spent 14 hours a week with a broader group of friends a decade ago, 12 hours a week in 2019, only 10 hours a week in 2021. Now let this sink in. Most Americans, this is profound, I think. Most Americans, the survey went on to say, did not transfer that lost time with friends to spending more time with spouses or children Instead, they spent more time alone. He said, you're the light of the world. The city set on the hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp, he said, and puts it under a basket. Rather, you put it on a lamp stand and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they'll see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. He said, you're the salt of the earth. For the salt to be Helpful, it can't stay in the salt shaker, it can't be distant from fruits and meat, uh, vegetables and, 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 and meat. It has to be attached to, it has to be in proximity with. See, Jesus says you're the light of the world. And if you're going to light the world, you can't light the world in isolation, hidden under a bowl. You're the salt of the earth. If you're going to be the salt of the earth, you can't do it in isolation, sitting on the counter. Jesus said, I've come to the world to seek and to save that which is lost. The Father, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. It's really hard to be an influence for Christ in isolation. So Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples. So we're not surprised then to read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and following, when the church is most effective, what is it doing? It is connected. It is involved. People are not isolated. Whether you're reading about Jesus and how he lived as an adult in community, constantly with his friends, his three close friends, his 12 
closest friends, his 120 close followers. Whether you're reading Jesus' commands, whether you're seeing the example of the New Testament church itself, it is clear that Jesus and his followers devoted themselves, deeply devoted themselves to fellowship, to each other, to being together. I'm shocked. I'm, 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 um, uh, um, impressed that that was not a chore for them. It was not just an obligation. It was some, not some legalistic obedience they did because the preacher told them they had to. It was common sense for people who loved God and people who love people that they would live life together. You know what I observed when I was in India the uh, first time? Persecuted Christians live life together because they can't stand to live it alone. When you are re really being persecuted, severely persecuted by those who hate you, despise you, even want to take your life, you can't help but want to be together with other Christians to find encouragement and strength, people who will pray for you and support you. See, while our felt need may not be as intense as those people in the first century persecution or the people that I met in India, our real need is just as sincere. It's just as real, just as deep. It makes me wonder, verse 46, in Acts 2, they ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Being together intensified their worship of God, their evangelism for the lost, and their own ability for joy. Reminds me of an illustration that I learned once when I was a kid. The next time you look at a, take, see a fire, look at the embers. In a sense, all the heat in that fire is really being produced by a lot of embers, individual embers, together. Keep those embers together and they can provide heat for everybody in the place. But take one of those embers and isolate it. Remove it from closeness with the other embers and what happens? Slowly it begins to cool. Slowly, that which was once red hot begins to fade. Isolate it long enough, it will grow stone cold. But return it to the embers in time, and it will turn hot again. That's a great picture for us to remember today as Christians, as the church. We have a world that says the way that you live is in isolation. And then if you're together with other people, that's just a thing that you do occasionally so that you can fulfill yourself. God's word tells us and common sense tells us we need each other. If you are starting to feel cold, like you are, you, your, your faith is not as hot as you would like it to be. Your connection with God is not as strong. Then connect with people, get together. Satan will whisper to you, hey, you don't have the time. You need more time for yourself. You're too tired. But if you isolate, your heart will grow cold. As a church, we're the light of the world. One of the great challenges I think we have at New Life right now I, um, is the, there, there, are, um, there are many people who, are, who attend maybe on Sunday morning, but they're not connected through the week. They're feeding on God's word on Sunday morning and worshiping God on Sunday morning, but then the rest of the week spending in isolation individually. Um, and that just is hard to stay encouraged and hot for the Lord in a difficult world. As a church, you're the light of the world. Satan wants to divide us. He wants to disconnect us from involvement from each other. He wants to separate us in our activities so that we won't do life together. So the next time the church is doing something and you think, I won't be missed. Yes, you will. And you think, I'm not needed. Yes, you are. And you think, it's too much for me to sacrifice. I don't have the time. 
yes, you do have the time. It may be a sacrifice, but my guess is that it's going to be a sacrifice of something that may be more emotionally attracting, uh, attractive, but much more spiritually insignificant. See, it's not all about you individually. You're not born for yourself. I'm not born for myself. We are born for life with God. And if we're born for life with God, we are part of his family, the body of Christ. And as each member blesses other members, then you'll be blessed by blessing others. Heavenly Father, draw us close to you. Help us to be your church. I pray that this passage, Acts 2, 42 and following, will be heard by the right people, will be shared by people, that you would make us your church in this time, in this generation that is, that is becoming increasingly dark and cold toward you. Lord, may we draw together and be on fire for you um, because you are worthy of our, our praise, you're worthy of our obedience, and because we believe that your word is true, even when it contradicts our emotions. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks for sharing. Pray, ask for your prayers. Until next time.